we'll talk about. But what if I told you that I had invented a machine that needed no fuel, little maintenance, steadily sequesters carbon, enriches the soil, cools the ground, scrubs the air, and scales easily to any size. And not only that, it drops, its own, drops food for free and copies itself. And it's very beautiful. That seems like something you would invest in, right? This type of machine. Would your answer change? Would you still invest if I told you that this machine is actually a tree? Uh, this is the uh, angel tree in South Carolina. It's one of the most photographed trees in the world. It's a huge tourist draw, tourism draw. Um, I've had the fortune to see it. It's an amazing tree and obviously has a lot of value. Or what if somebody invented a machine that filters pollutants from urban and rural waters, decreases flooding, prevents erosion, can be used for recreation, provides habitat for many different species of animals, doesn't require any fuel, and is so beautiful that some of Monet's most famous paintings are of them. That sounds almost too good to be true. What an amazing invention, right? That's something you would invest in? I, I mean, I, I sure would. What is it? We're talking about a wetland. So wetlands provide all these different values. Uh, this is actually one of Monet's water lily paintings. Uh, kind of funny to me and a little bit ironic that it's a lot easier to put a value on this painting than it is on the wetland that was painted. Uh, why, is it, why is it so much easier to do that? There's a lot of evidence that wetlands do have value. And in fact, people are willing to pay quite a bit of money for wetlands. Um, this is a picture of a farm field uh, along the Lake Erie shoreline in the Ottawa National Wildlife Refuge in spring of 2010. It's called the Blousy Tract. Uh, this one was part of a larger effort to restore and enhance about 3,000 acres of coastal wetlands and uplands in the Ottawa National Wildlife Refuge along the Lake Erie shoreline. This was a 171 acre farm. We were able to get funding and work with uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and Ducks Unlimited to restore this land back to wetlands. And I want to show you uh, just kind of some of the resilience of nature and what happened here. A couple more pictures from the site. Uh, we did the construction on the site in winter of 2012. And I was going to give a talk in spring 2013 about some of our coastal restoration work. I went out the morning of the presentation to see how things were going and took that shot uh, spring 2013. It's incredible to see that resilience and what's come back. You see the great egrets in there uh, waiting. Uh, this also provides habitat for fish. It helps to uh, filter nutrients from farm fields that uh, drain into the property um, through ditches and provides so many other values. Uh, again, we were able to capture funding for that, but we really don't know what the value is of all that work. Being able to talk about the economic value of wetlands would be super helpful in policy. Uh, we were able to talk about wetlands and their, their uh, role in nutrient management and some of the other benefits of wetlands like the recreational values, um, aesthetic values, and we're able to get into a recently announced program called H2 Ohio, funding for wetlands as a part of the solution to the harmful algae blooms for Lake Erie and the rest of the state. There's about $172 million going into this program over two years, uh, which roughly half is going to wetlands, which is a pretty incredible uh, part of this. Again, um, to have the economic information though on the value of these wetlands would really enable us to uh, argue for additional policies and support for, for wetland creation. And for many other ecosystem services that the speakers will talk about, um, that kind of information uh, that's coming out of, of this research is really a value to conservation organizations like ours uh, that are looking to build more support for the work that we do. So we're really appreciative of the work that the team is doing and uh, the, the way that we will be able to use that information for future successes and to get more conservation done in Ohio and in other places. So at the end of here, before I turn it back over to the team, I wanna make a kind of a shameless plug for the Nature Conservancy. Uh, this is a group of volunteers, um, one of, of many that we've had working at the Nature Conservancy. You can see they're pretty happy. Um, 
If you want to learn more about our organization, you can visit nature.org backslash Ohio and you can look for volunteer opportunities. Uh, I'm Bill Stanley, our state director, and uh, myself or others on our team would be happy to, to talk to people. Uh, so, uh, Brent, um, I'm going to turn it back over to you guys. Thanks, Bill. Uh, we really appreciate it. Um, we're going to switch over now and switch it over to Tim Hab, uh, the chair of the Department of Ag, Environment, and Development Economics. And we'll sh Tim, I'll share the other slides here for you. Okay. Yeah, I just want to uh, take a minute to thank everybody for uh, for listening in today. Uh, as Brent said, I'm chair of the Department of Agricultural, Environmental, and Development Economics here in the College of Food, Ag, and Environmental Sciences. Uh, a lot of words in all of those titles, but um, uh, the key to this is uh, to the key to what we do and the key to what the college does is that that we're an integrated college across ag, environment, uh, and uh, food, and so. Uh, what we view in, the, in our department as applied economics, we apply it to, uh, uh, to a, a, a large number of topics. And one of the topics that we really try to focus on is uh, this issue of how do we place values on things that don't typically have values in markets. Um, so we, we have a core of faculty here, probably the, the largest core anywhere in the world, of uh, economists who work in this area of trying to uh, place values on, uh, on nature place value on environmental and natural resources. Um, uh, Brent's in that group, and we have a couple of other faculty who are in that group also. Actually, we probably have a, a seven faculty members who are in that group. Uh, and so we're really excited to be able to bring some of that work to you today uh, on the economic valuation of natural areas in Ohio, um, uh, generated by some of the world's experts in the area. Um, and so uh, on this report, uh, it, we, we've integrated a, a couple of students into the report. Uh, and uh, partner with the School of Environment and Natural Resources to produce this. Uh, it's complementary to a report we put out uh, a few years ago on the, uh, the economic value of agriculture in Ohio. Uh, and this one focuses on natural areas. And just to introduce the, sort of the team of researchers that worked on this, um, we have an undergraduate researcher, uh, Roman Jalio, uh, who's in our EADS major, the Environment, Economy, Development, and Sustainability major. Um, Brent uh, is an environmental economist here in our department, uh, Brent Sanjan. Um, I'm in the department. Jeremy Bruscotter uh, is a professor in the School of Environment and Natural Resources. And also Ryan Bruni is also on the report, uh, another undergraduate student uh, who's um, uh, not here with us today. Uh, he graduated last year, uh, but he helped to generate some of the numbers that are in the report. Uh, so I will uh, leave my comments short to allow other people uh, a little bit more time. Uh, and I will turn it over to uh, Roman. Yeah, so we're going to be, that was the introduction. Now we're going to get right into the presentation. So talking about what this report does. How do I advance? Uh, oh, technical difficulties. Sorry, we can't advance the slide. One second, folks, we'll be right there. There we go. Cool. So we're going to be presenting estimates of outdoor recreation in Ohio. So what is outdoor recreation and what are people doing in Ohio? How many trips are they taking and what is their value? And so in Ohio, we have various types of activities boating, biking, hiking, swimming, but we also have an array of winter activities, cross-country skiing, downhill skiing and snowboarding, um, and some rock climbing opportunities as well. So we have the full gamut of outdoor recreation. Um, and then also we'll be presenting estimates of the contribution of outdoor recreation to the state's economy. And then we'll be talking about four ecosystem services and their value by county. Um, just an introduction to ecosystem services. Their services provided by natural land in Ohio. So the four that we'll be talking about today is the provisioning service of agriculture, um, logging of forests in Ohio, the use of forests for recreation, um, and then the consumer surplus from those forests, and also the carbon sequestration from forests. So why did we decide to conduct this analysis? If you're an outdoor recreation enthusiast, I think you can understand that trails are getting more crowded, uh, rock climbing areas are getting more popular and waterways are becoming crowded as well. So 
nature-based recreation seems to be growing nationally, but we don't really have a full picture of it in Ohio. So we kind of wanted to discover that to inform some of the policy that um, Bill kind of alluded to. And then we're gonna be presenting the contribution of outdoor recreation to the national economy and the Bureau of Economic Analysis um, had a report that concluded that outdoor recreation contributes more than 2% um, to the national economy. So we wanted to understand what percentage is being contributed by outdoor recreation here in Ohio. Um, and that can kind of inform policy as well. And then before we kind of understood that Ohio had a relatively little public recreational land per person and per acre of land. So we wanted to value those services. And then ecosystem services is something else that we talked about in the report. And it's a useful way to organize concepts for landscape analysis. So what is the value here in Ohio and how can that inform land use changes in the state of Ohio? So getting into what we found in the report, we found that there's 171 million outdoor trips being taken by Ohioans in Ohio per year. So a pretty substantial amount of people recreating here in the state. And we found out that those consumers um, are receiving $3.6 billion per year um, in value. And basically that estimate came from what consumers kind of give up in order to um, go on these outdoor recreation trips. So they give up wages and doing other things um, as a result. And then things that consumers spent on these outdoor recreation trips, $5.9 billion per year. Um, and as a result, it's contributing upwards of $8.1 billion a year to Ohio's economy. And that repre represents about a contribution of 1.3% to the state economy. So similar to the Bureau of Economic Analysis's um, conclusion. And then finally, as a result of that contribution, it's employing um, upwards of 133,000 people indirectly or directly um, in Ohio. And then moving into what we found in terms of ecosystem services, we found that they're worth $5.8 billion per year or $287 per acre per year. And one of the majority drivers in that estimate was forest carbon. And we found that that was worth $3.1 billion per year or 404 acres um, per acre per year. So a large amount of value is coming from that, coming from forests in Ohio sequestering that carbon um, and that kind of drove the ecosystem services estimate. And then talking about some of the trends in outdoor recreation, um, just to kind of understand the demographic and what people are doing. Long-term data shows that traditional forms such as hunting and fishing are starting to decline in popularity um, and other forms are starting to grow substantially in recent years. Things like bird watching, photography, kayaking, rock climbing, and more local park visits are becoming much more popular in the outdoor recreational field. And also that varies with where you're going in terms of outdoor recreation. So a lot of state parks or national parks um, restrict the hunting or fishing and kind of incentivize other forms of that outdoor recreation, such as the bird watching or kayaking or just cruising through that park. And so moving into what kind of trips people are taking um, in the state of Ohio, Mainly it's driven by local park visits. That's the majority of what we found with 60,000 um, trips being taken a year. Um, and compared to some of the other things such as fishing and hunting, 20,000 or 20 million for fishing and 8 million for hunting are being taken. And sorry, I messed up the estimate for local parks. That's 60 million um, trips per year. And then you can kind of see on the right, the economic value and the consumer surplus people are gaining from those trips. So things like state national park day use and fishing have a much more higher economic value and consumer surplus versus those local park visits, um, mainly due to the higher quality of those parks or maybe just the higher tier activity like fishing where a local park is just a quick day trip to it. And then how much are they spending on their trips? Um, that's differentiated from their consumer surplus. This is what they're spending into the economy, either with their gas or the food they stop and get when they go to these um, places. Some of the main value that's being driven is fishing with almost $2 billion being generated with fishing in terms of trip expenditure. Um, and comparing that to local park visits, we have $364 million for that. So there's large differentiation in the expenditure per trip, um, even though that local 
parks might have a lot more visitors. And that's the same with the state and national park day use. You're looking at $1.3 billion in trip expenditure. As you can see on the left side, there's also estimates for hiking, boating, off highway vehicle use, and also bicycling, which has become very popular in recent years. Thank you. All right, thanks a lot, Roman. Um, sorry, we're doing a little old school. We're back and forth here uh, in terms of the pres presenting. Um, so what we wanted to do now is go through some of these estimates in a little more detail and just talk through where some of the data came from. Uh, one of our hopes in this study is to present the data that we have uh, and to make uh, clear as well that, that a lot more needs to be done to quantify these ecosystem services, to quantify recreational activity within the state, especially outdoor recreational activity. There's a lot of data available, um, but you'll see some of this as we talk through it, some of the limitations with the data and hopefully generate some ideas about how we can fix some of those limitations. So the biggest, one of the biggest categories of visitation was the visits to local parks. I wanted to talk a little bit about how we did that. So some park districts, you know, Toledo, uh, Cleveland, in particular, have really good reports that have been done by uh, consulting agencies on uh, visitation to those parks. We were able to take um, advantage of some of that to learn about the visitation of those districts. Uh, Columbus Metro Parks or Franklin County Metro Parks have uh, fairly good data as to, does the Summit County Metro Parks. So we took those data and determined that there's a wide variation in these sort of metro areas in terms of visits per person, the four to 10 visits per person per year. Um, we didn't have data from Cincinnati. We didn't have data, data from Dayton, et cetera. We couldn't find it online. So we assume that those other metro areas in the state, uh, which constitute the bulk of the actual population in the state, 8 million people out of the 11 million in the state are in, in metro areas. So we assumed in those other metro areas that people were taking on average five visits per person per year to their local parks. Seems reasonable given the data we have from the existing uh, studies. Um, we assume in non-metro areas, a much lower visit intensity of one visit per person per year. Uh, so that was how we generated the estimate of the local park visits. More can be done on that and we need to learn more, especially in rural areas and in some of the other metro areas that haven't done more specific studies. So we will be looking into that and if, we, if there's anybody out there who wants to partner with us on that, we'd love to hear from you. Bicycling, bicycling is a very challenging thing to try to estimate. The Outdoor Foundation has a very nice report suggesting that 16% of Americans bike, taking 48 trips per person per year, that that's 16%, that's a huge number of trips per person for a, a relatively large proportion of the population. Um, so big number of trips biking. Uh, uh, the Mid-Ohio Regional Planning Commission has a nice study of the metro uh, area here in Columbus, the bike paths in Columbus, and found uh, you know the population, 9% of the metro population is actually using the bike path in some way, shape, or form, taking up to 72 trips per person per year of that 9%, so significant visitation there. So we took these two uh, data sets and made some assumptions about how they could apply to different places. Uh, you know, Columbus might have a little more better biking weather, for instance, and Cincinnati might have a little better biking weather than Cleveland, uh, given more snow in the Cleveland area. So we assume 22% fewer trips just based on snow days up there. In rural areas, we assume 40% fewer trips <clears throat> biking uh, due to access, uh, uh, limit, more limited access to, to trails and things like that. Um, and that's how we generated this estimate of 34.2. Again, with bicycling, uh, we can improve this estimate over time, and hopefully we will, uh, by doing better studies um, in the future. Uh, parks, this is an interesting one. Uh, we have a lot of data on visitation to different parks around the state. <clears throat> so we're able to put together data from a number of these different districts I just wanted to put, point this out to you that, that this is one of the more, more interesting things to me is that Ohio State Parks estimates from uh, data they provided to the National Association of Park Directors uh, that there are 38 million visits to the state parks. Uh, there is about 115,000 acres. That means that the visit intensity is about 335 visits per acre per year. Now compared to the other places in the state which are public lands, that's an enormous and intense visitation uh, you know, in, intensity of visitation um, in our state parks. <clears throat> Many of you probably have experienced that, uh, given uh, at some of our state parks at certain times of the year, there's a, a large number of people there, which is excellent. Uh, and it's highly valued, as, we, as we've shown in this report, that's extremely valuable, um, but suggests that, you know, in, that there is certainly room for expanding either state parks or expanding other lands on which people can have access uh, to the types of outdoor recreation they might do at those places. Wildlife areas is another uh, another area I wanted to sort of draw your attention to. That's at the bottom. 
Uh, these are areas that have been purchased by the Division of Wildlife using hunting uh, money from uh, hunting licenses over the years. Uh, what we found from that, and this is, represents a big chunk of our estimates of the ecosystem services part later, is that these wildlife areas have become extremely valuable for recreation outside of hunting. They're very valuable for hunting as well, uh, but they have become extremely valuable for recreationists who want to do hiking and uh, fishing or some kind of boating on some of the lakes of those wildlife areas. So we see a, a bit higher of an intensity of visitation in wildlife areas compared to the other places, just given the, 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 the way in which the state has actually purchased those lands, uh, the distribution of those across the state and access that people have to them. Uh, so that's how we got park estimates. Uh, hiking and camping is interesting. Some of those park estimates include hiking and camping. The reason we wanted to separate hiking and camping is because in fact, relative to other kinds of day trips, uh, a camping trip is a bit more valuable. Uh, so we wanted to assign a little more value to the, to the camping trips uh, component of those. So we tried to figure out how many of those trips to say state land were hiking type trips. Uh, we had some great data from uh, Jeremy Bruscott, who's done a number of studies of recreation in the state as well as across the country and the world. Uh, so we're able to use some of that data to get a sense for how many of the trips uh, in the state parks, national parks, and uh, Wayne National Forest, et cetera, were uh, associated with hiking and camping, and in particular with camping. So we tried to break that out. So these have been broken out from, um, when you see the aggregate data in our report, uh, these types of trips are actually broken out, uh, the, the ones that are sort of more intensive hiking and camping trips. Um, and that's mainly because they actually do carry a bit more value. Boating is another interesting thing, as was pointed out by the slide earlier that, that Roman talked about. Um, there seems to have been a substitution in recreational behavior in the state that is we've seen a drop off in fishing activity and that's potentially been displaced or changed uh, into some kind of boating activity. So I just want to present some numbers here, that, uh, especially in the canoeing and kayaking realm, because that seems to be an activity that's really taken off in recent years. Um, in 2012, according to the Coast Guard data and a report by the Coast Guard, uh, there were 1.5 million trips uh, in canoes and kayaks in Ohio. And when we added in the number of people on those trips, 3.3 million uh, person trips per year. That seems to have gone up a lot. The Outdoor Foundation estimates that in 2015, there were 1.2 million participants in Ohio on canoe kayak type trips, and that, that amounted to 8.3 million person trips per year. So potentially significant increase in that kind of outdoor activity. Um, we use the Coast Guard numbers on our estimates so far, kind of combine those a bit with the Outdoor Foundation numbers. Uh, to get a sense for how many trips were activities. Uh, but that's one where we need to pay a lot more attention uh, because it seems to be one that's changing a lot uh, and changing relatively rapidly in terms of increasing the number of trips for canoeing and kayaking. You know, power boating has remained fairly similar. Uh, it looks to me like the permits in the, in the state have, you know, like kind of go up and go down. Maybe they've trended down a bit over the years, but there's still a significant uh, proportion of people who have uh, power boats in the state <clears throat> we're using them for a significant number of trips. It's still a value activity in the state. Off highway vehicle use, you know, this is an interesting one. This is one I think we've underestimated. We only have data from the U.S. Forest Service study. The Wayne National Forest did a study of recreational use in the Wayne National Forest. Uh, they estimate 52,000 trips uh, in that area. There's other parts of the state that are, you know, open for off-road vehicle uh, use. Um, so we've likely underestimated this, and this is a reasonably valuable type of an activity out there uh, on state lands or on public lands. So it's one that we need to learn more about. Here are the sets of values that we use, and I wanted to just point these out to you and give you a sense for the estimates of, of the sort of per day value or per trip value. Uh, so you know, bicycling, relatively lower value than, for example, boating, uh, given that you know, bicycling can often be done from your home. It doesn't take a lot of effort to get to the bicycling locations. I know in some cases it does, depending on the trip. But on average, people might be able to do it right from their house. Uh, and so, you know, boating takes a little more effort to, to engage in, to get to a site where you can do boating. Uh, so it carries a little bit more value. Fishing, a little more value as well. A big value is sort of hiking and camping on state lands, uh, sort of non-state park lands. <clears throat> that actually comes from estimates uh, from data collected by Jeremy Bruscott for uh, the Division of Wildlife uh, on, the, on the wildlife lands. Uh, so there's enormous value on those lands and enormous value for hiking and camping on those lands. Uh, some of that carries uh, hunting. And then you can see at the bottom that hunting is another fairly highly valuable activity. Local park visits get the least value in terms of uh, the CS or daily trip value um, because many uh, local parks are relatively close to the people who are using them. 
Uh, and that's one of the reasons why they carry a little less value. Uh, expenditures are there on the right to give you a sense for how much uh, each of those trips uh, produces in terms of local uh, expenditure value. Um, so that's kind of an estimate of, or, or a run through of where we got our data. I'm gonna turn it over to Tim now, uh, to Dr. Hab to talk through the economic contribution of this to the state. So Tim. Thanks Brent. Uh, as Brent sort of uh, laid it out in the previous slides, uh, there's a, a bunch of different ways to measure the economic value of uh, outdoor recreation. Uh, we can measure it by the, uh, the value that consumers place on taking recreation trips. We call that the consumer surplus. Uh, we can get a sense of the economic importance uh, that outdoor recreation brings to an area by looking at how much money uh, is spent by consumers, uh, so the consumer expenditures. Um, each of those measures of value uh, gives a piece of the overall picture uh, of how consumers value outdoor recreation. Uh, but from those numbers, it's difficult to compare across industries and identify the contribution that uh, Ohio's natural areas bring to the Ohio's economy. Uh, to get a better idea of how big Ohio's natural recreation industry is, uh, we can try to parse out the contribution of recreation to each of Ohio's industries uh, as defined by the, 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 the Bureau of Economic Analysis uh, for the U.S. Uh, by calculating a percentage of each industry uh, made up of value, uh, made up from value generated or added by outdoor recreation, uh, what we're able to do is get an estimate of the percentage of state gross domestic product contributed by outdoor recreation. Um, so this will give us a number that we can sort of compare to gross state product and then gross national product to see how much Ohio's uh, actually contributing. Uh, so as we can see in the table, uh, the economic contribution of outdoor recreation uh, consists of direct expenditures on recreational activities. Uh, and on equipment, uh, things like gas, food, hotels, um, camping, uh, bait and tackle, other equipment, it's manufacturing. Uh, in addition, there's indirect uh, recreational expenditures like uh, uh, just the IT associated with recreational sales or uh, accountants, other services, uh, wholesalers, utilities. Uh, they all add value to the outdoor recreation industry in Ohio. Uh, so everything along the supply chain that ends with, with recreation trips contributes to uh, the value of outdoor recreation. So putting all those pieces together, we end up with uh, an estimate of outdoor recreation uh, in Ohio that adds $8.1 billion to Ohio's economy, uh, or about 1.25% of the overall, uh, of Ohio's overall economies contributed by outdoor recreation. Uh, on their own, those numbers probably don't mean a whole lot, but we can take a look at some other numbers that have been generated and see uh, how they compare. Uh, recently, the Bureau of Economic Analysis has put out a value of outdoor recreation uh, number for both nationally and by state. Um, and the BEA estimates that the value of outdoor recreation uh, in Ohio is 10.2 billion. So that compares to our estimate of uh, uh, 8.1 billion. Uh, and they say it's about 1.6% of Ohio's gross state product. We, uh, our estimate's about 1.3%. Uh, the BEA numbers uh, are larger uh, than those that we present. Uh, we use a slightly different definition of outdoor recreation. Uh, the BEA's uh, definition is a little bit more comprehensive. It includes things like amusement parks, festivals, and outdoor concerts. So uh, Cedar Point and Kings Island uh, fall into the definition of outdoor recreation by, uh, uh, by the BEA. Uh, we wanted to focus instead just on natural areas and try to see if we can come up with an estimate of things that don't necessarily have market prices associated with them. Uh, so we chose a narrower definition that focuses uh, on the natural areas, and that's uh, why our numbers are probably a little bit smaller than what the BEA came out with. Uh, second point of comparison uh, is a 2017 report that uh, Brent and I helped author on, uh, author on the economic value of agriculture and food production to Ohio. Um, in that report, we used similar methods to what we used here uh, and found that the farming and agricultural production sectors contributed about 5.75 billion uh, dollars to Ohio's economy, uh, just under 1%. Uh, and the food processing industry added another $15 billion or 2.43% of Ohio's gross state product. Uh, that means that the outdoor recreation industry, uh, the, the estimates that we've come up with, uh, place outdoor recreation industry somewhere between agricultural production uh, and food processing in terms of industry size in Ohio. Um, so it's a, it's a sizable industry when you, uh, when you take into account the, the, the comparison numbers. Um, so you can go ahead and click forward there, Brent. Uh, there we go, there sorry. We go. Uh, 
Uh, in terms of number of jobs, uh, we find that uh, the uh, that outdoor recreation uh, contributes about 131,000 private sector jobs. Again, just for a point of reference, uh, that's actually more jobs than either the uh, the agricultural production sector or the food processing sector uh, contribute to Ohio. So it's a, it's a sizable industry. Uh, it's concentrated in retail and recreation. So uh, uh, places like sporting goods stores um, uh, and uh, uh, food services. Uh, provide uh, large numbers of jobs for the recreation industry. Um, also, uh, obviously, the transportation sector is a big piece of that, too, um, in terms of jobs. Um, our estimates might under underestimate uh, manufacturing. It's hard to allocate recreational outputs to various sectors. Uh, the apparel sector is probably low, uh, but equipment, um, we may be a little bit high on that. Things like trailers, uh, uh, RV parts, RV uh, uh, RV sales, those types of things are, are a little bit different, difficult to track. So we may, may have uh, underestimate, uh, uh, we may have overestimated those uh, in some of our numbers. But, uh, but overall, you can see that, that the outdoor recreation industry in Ohio is a sizable industry and comparable uh, in scale to farming in uh, the food production sector. And I'll turn it back over to... Yeah, coming back to me. Thanks, Tim. Okay, uh, thanks. So the last, the last section of our discussion here uh, before we move on to sort of a question and answer is um, to talk about the ecosystem services part of the report. Uh, I wanted to also say that Jeremy Bruscotter is unable to be with us today in terms of he was a little bit ill, so he's unable to participate on this, but he would have been participating as well and giving a couple of these slides. So a couple of the slides are given by us um, and were produced by Jeremy, especially this one. You know, ecosystem services, you know, it's become a sort of an organizing concept amongst uh, many people, especially in academic, but also in the sort of policy world to think through um, how do we, how do we think about the values that natural land provide to us? And one way to think about it is to think about the ecosystem services that are provided by the land. So that we, we break them into four different areas. One is provisioning services. These are the ones where there's direct economic benefits. And in our report, we do talk about two of them, uh, agriculture and uh, logging. Then there are also supporting services, cultural services, and regulating services where economic benefits are more indirectly measured. Um, so you can think of the nutrient cycling, the primary production, soil formation, et cetera. Uh, you know, forest, one of the things we're able to measure here provides carbon cycling. We are able to measure that component of it. Uh, some of the discussion that Bill had earlier about, you know, phosphorus and wetlands and nitrogen cycling in wetlands and their ability to, to do that cycling for us and to help keep it out of the environment in a negative way and to, to do something useful with it, for example, in a wetland. Um, we, aren't, we haven't made estimates of those values yet, uh, but those are certainly things that would be on our radar screen to try to produce in the future. Uh, educational, aesthetic, and recreational, so we do capture that, at least the recreational component of that and the cultural services in our report. Um, regulating services, flood regulation, uh, flood control, climate regulation. So climate regulation we capture in part through the carbon in terms of the value part of that. Uh, water purification and flood control, we don't capture uh, in here so well. Um, those things, you know, we thought about trying to capture them. One of the reasons we didn't go down the road of, of, of valuing them, because there are very good studies that would allow us to value them. Um, they're very specific to places. So where you have the natural lands have a, has a big impact on the value that it provides for flood control and water purification. And we didn't feel that we had a good spatial handle on that yet. So the services that we have estimated so far are those for which we thought we had good sort of control over the spatial area and extent to which um, those values were, were relevant. Uh, so down the road, we'd like to do a better job on this and we'll certainly be working to update this report uh, to, to capture uh, some of those benefits a little more effectively down the road. Um, so what are the values that we found so far? So in this study, the ecosystem services on natural land that we estimate, so agriculture, uh, the data we got from that is from basically the, the land rent, the, the return, net returns to agriculture on an annual basis. The average value statewide is about $112 per acre per year. There's 12.2 million acres. So total annual value is 1.3 or $1.4 billion per year. Timber outputs, uh, the average value on a piece of timber land is $62 per acre per year, over 6.8 million acres of timber land. And that amounts to about $423 million in annual value per year. Carbon storage, uh, that's $404 per acre per year. That's the biggest sort of value that we have that was valued with what we call the social cost of carbon. Assuming that social cost of carbon is uh, $39 per, 
ton of carbon dioxide. There's 7.7 .7 million acres of forest land uh, in the state. It's slightly different than timberland as, as used for the timber part. And that means that the value of carbon storage in the state is $3.1 billion per year. Uh, and that's just the value that those standing forests provide in terms of uh, regulating services and keeping that carbon out of our atmosphere and avoiding the potential damages of that carbon in our atmosphere. Uh, public forest recreation is another very big sort of service value. Uh, that's worth $309 per acre per year. Uh, this is over a relatively small number of acres, 890,000 acres um, of public land, of public forest lands in the state. So that amounts to $274 million in total annual value. Um, now, interestingly, that study of that $300, $309 per acre per year came out of uh, data that was produced by uh, Dr. Bruscotter in his work with the Division of Wildlife. Um, the data is a bit old. It was a study that was done in 2011. Uh, however, it's one of the best studies of, of recreation on those Division of Wildlife lands. It provides uh, and enables us to actually estimate what the value of that land is. Um, the private forest recreation, we basically had to take the public forest recreation and just simply assume that 20 percent, uh, that the value of the private forest recreation was 20 percent of the public forest recreation. Uh, so that's why we get the $71, roughly 20 percent of the $309 per acre per year. Um, the rationale for that is that, you know, privately individuals get a lot of benefits out of that. We don't have good estimates of what the private recreational benefit is. Uh, it would be great to get that and understand that better. So that's another thing we'd like to do in the future uh, is to estimate that a little more effectively. And when we combine these things together over the state's 20 million acres of natural land, agriculture, forest land, both public and private, um, our estimated value is $287 per acre per year for a total annual value of 5.8 billion per year in sort of ecosystem services. And that's just for these uh, services we've estimated. Some issues to consider. One of the things we haven't done uh, is we've got farming and timber value. Uh, they're really important, but we haven't included the externalities from farming. So water quality is one negative one, open space is one positive one. So these would, you know, if we were able to include these, these may increase or decrease the, the farming value. Um, private land provides enormous carbon, uh, public carbon sequestration services. So that's a, a nice pro of these estimates. We've been able to provide those estimates. Um, we have really good estimates of what the carbon value is across the state. Um, on the other hand, on the con side, we've probably underestimated private recreational benefits, uh, as I talked about earlier. That's a real issue, and we want to try to address that through future studies. Um, we found that public forest recreation is extremely valuable. Uh, that makes sense in the state. We have a limited amount of public space available for people to actually use in the state. Uh, and as our results have shown, and many of the studies we've looked at have shown, whenever there's public land that people can recreate on the state in the state of Ohio, they do it, and it's worth a, a large amount of money. Um, we have missed some important ecosystem services, especially those related to prairies and some wetlands. Um, as I'll show on the maps here in a second, um, just, yeah, so looking at these maps, um, you know, Bill showed wetlands that were created up in um, along the Lake Erie shoreline, and I wanted to bring your attention to this right-hand side graph. Um, these these recreational estimates that we have are based on the data I talked about from uh, Dr. Bruscotter, and you know these values are enormous along Lake Erie, and the reason for that is because this is a great flyway for lots of species moving through there. And that's one of the biggest recreational values on that public land. Uh, and that generates enormous values for the state in terms of providing public recreation opportunities. So, you know, to, to Bill's point of how do we start to value what these wetlands in that particular place are worth, uh, what we know is, based on this data, is that those wetlands there are worth a huge amount of money in terms of the recreational benefits they provide because it's, a, it's you know, it's the flyover. It's not the flyover from, you know, the West Coast to the East Coast, but it's the flyover of the, uh, of the birds going from you know far north to the far south uh, on an annual basis. Um, other areas in the state have large recreational values as well. However, those are, are a bit more dispersed than in that northern quadrant of the state. Uh, so finally, when we look at the map of all ecosystem services in the state, uh, and this is just a summary of all of them that we quantified, uh, we get big value kind of in the north and in the south, and you can kind of see a reasonably large value around some of our urban areas, especially in Cleveland, uh, Cincinnati, and also in the southwestern part of the state. Um, so that's it for the ecosystem services discussion. The report is online. We would invite all of you to go to the, the site and, and get that report. Um, uh, we can send out an email to all of you who have participated in this. If you don't have access to that, let us know. Uh, we'll provide it. Um, 
So I'm going to turn it back over to Tim to go through a conclusion, uh, and then we'll open up to questions. Okay. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on conclusions because I kind of rambled over on my own time uh, earlier. But uh, I, I think the big takeaway is that uh, there's there's a huge value for uh, for natural lands in Ohio, uh, whether it's from recreation, um, actual expenditures as a percentage of gross state product. Um, 131,000 private jobs. I think if you just take a look at it, uh, it puts uh, uh, Ohio's outdoor recreation industry on par uh, uh, with uh, agricultural production in Ohio, uh, even a little bit larger than that. Um, and that doesn't account for some of the ecosystem services, the non-market values that these lands provide. Uh, uh, some of our estimates show that about $5.7 billion uh, in benefits from the ecosystem services. Uh, that's in addition to, uh, to some of those marketed values that we talked about. Uh, so um, private forests, uh, large recreational value, they exceed uh, timber values. Uh, public forests provide enormous uh, values per hectare. Uh, not surprising, uh, given that they're relatively scarce. Uh, and that all forests uh, provide a large and valuable carbon sink. Uh, carbon sequestration is huge in terms of, of thinking about uh, removing carbon dioxide uh, from the atmosphere. Um, and so um, having forested lands uh, provides a huge value in terms of carbon sequestration. So um, uh, we're excited about these results. We think it places uh, Ohio's natural areas uh, in the right context. We know there's a lot of work still to be done, but um, uh, we look forward to any questions that you have and any uh, uh, answers we can hopefully provide for you. So thanks for joining us. Great, thanks, Tim. Um, just a reminder to folks, a few people have gotten on there and we've got a number of questions on the chat feature. So feel free to go on there and uh, send in the questions. Uh, we've got about uh, 15 more minutes and we'll spend a little bit of this time just talking amongst the, uh, uh, the contributors here, uh, working through discussions from, or some of the questions from you. Uh, from our own perspectives and also bringing Bill in to get his perspective as well. Actually, Bill Hurt uh, asked one of the first questions, I guess, you know, was curious to hear more about the surprises. Uh, Bill, were you thinking about that? Would you like to hear more from people online what their surprises are in, in these numbers? Or were you sort of thinking, um, looking for us and our surprises with these numbers? You're muted. <laughs> I got to unmute you. There you're, I <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah, I think either one. I was actually thinking uh, from the, the presenters yourselves, but I, I would actually be curious if there are people online uh, as well. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, uh, I mean, yeah, I'll, I'll hear from you guys. I, there was one thing I was surprised about that I, I could mention, but I want to hear from the, uh, the presenters first. So from, from my perspective, one of the interesting things that we found, and, and um, I'll just go back up to that picture. I sort of already talked about it. This is recreational value. So this division of wildlife. And so this was a survey that, that Jeremy Bruscott had done in 2011, where they went to all, they designed a, a nice statistical analysis of how do you sort of calculate the visitation to these uh, division of wildlife lands. And what that survey shows is that these lands, these, pu these public lands are worth an enormous amount of money. Uh, they're worth an enormous amount to hunters, but, but the biggest value on them is the non-hunting folks, right? So the people spending, they're spending enormous amounts of time on, on these Division of Wildlife lands. So that tells me that, that folks in the Division of Wildlife did a, a really good job of finding the right places um, to, put, to put their parks, basically, uh, and that they've been managing them effectively and that these are creating huge value for people in the state. I would bet, Bill, that that would translate over to TNC type land as well, especially where there's public access on that land. Um, so you know, we don't know that because we don't have visitation data for that for your lands. But, you know, what we know is that public lands like this are providing just huge value. Uh, and it's, it's incredibly useful and valuable to people in the state. Um, so surprises I had, I don't know, Tim, Roman, any other surprises? Yeah, I would add um, just the value and the amount of people traveling to local parks surprised me. I kind of knew that people in Ohio love their local parks um, and went to them frequently. But this report, I think, really emphasizes that fact that parks around urban areas like Cleveland, Columbus, Cincinnati, Dayton, those parks really drive some of the value and really provide great ecosystem services to the people that live around them. And then I would also add just the fact that the outdoor recreation market is contributing 8.1 billion to Ohio's economy is pretty significant. And the fact that that represents 1.3% of like 
contribution to Ohio's economy is significant. Um, as the Bureau of Economic Analysis got 2% nationally, and our definition was a little different. So I personally thought it would be a lot lower, maybe like below 1%, just due to the differences in like our geographic region and the natural assets that we have. So the fact that it was still 1.3% with the difference in definition and the difference in um, geography and geology in Ohio, it's pretty significant. Yeah, and I'll just uh, follow up on that with, uh, with what Roman was saying, because I, uh, I think to me the biggest surprise was when you, when you look at some of those comparisons to other industries, having worked on uh, the report for agriculture and other things, uh, to put that, uh, that number into context and just see uh, how large the outdoor recreation, and, and we, we admit we're underestimating the size of uh, the outdoor recreation industry by some definitions, uh, and still it puts it on par with, uh, with farming and agricultural production uh, and even a little bit larger than that in terms of economic contribution, I think is uh, uh, pretty surprising to me. Uh, and I think it kind of puts into context where uh, we might want to think about uh, investing public resources as we go forward. I'd love to hear that. So uh, yeah, I'll, I just want to say uh, one of the things that um, Related to this, I think we do have quite a high population relative to the amount of public land we have in Ohio. So it probably means each acre is getting, you know, there's a scarcity in a sense uh, relative per capita compared to a lot of other states. So in some ways that doesn't surprise me that our the value per acre and the overall value kind of the acres we have is pretty high. That uh, to me speaks for the need for more uh, protected lands and public lands, which is obviously good for our mission. So thank you for that. Yeah, I think that hits on a key point, Bill, is that scarcity relative to public land in Ohio drives a lot of the value here, right? And that there's a, a substitution in a sense. I don't know, that's not really the right word, but it's one way to think about it, that when you have scarce land, the value of it's a lot higher, right? So um, there's another question from Sarah on, is there demographic data to support who uh, is generating uh, the value? And then, um, regarding the benefits of ecosystem services on human health. So I'm gonna turn it over to Roman to talk a bit about those two things. So the two questions are, is there, you know, do we know uh, much about who is doing the visitation? And then what about the relationship between uh, these ecosystem services and human health? Yeah, so in terms of who's traveling to these places and performing outdoor recreation, we didn't come up with any data in our study, but a study by the Outdoor Foundation about the outdoor recreation participation nationally discusses that 46% um, um, of those doing outdoor recreation are female and 54% are male. So it's a little skewed towards males traveling and doing performing these activities. And then it was also skewed to higher income folks that were performing these activities, which is to be expected as a lot of these places that are hard to get to, some require um, cost camping requires certain costs and certain access to gear and then it was also skewed towards um, people that had experience in college education um, college graduates and one to three years of people that went to college and then ethnicity um, which I think probably fits into Ohio is it was 73 percent or white that were performing these outdoor recreation activities so there's definitely a demographic reports out there about that um, the Outdoor Foundation was just one that we came across, but we don't have any really understanding of that here in Ohio, but we assume that it's pretty similar. And then in terms of ecosystem services um, and what impact that has on human health, there's information on that. I don't really, I can't speak to any reports that I know of off the top of my head, but the future arc of my research here um, as an undergraduate is gonna be centering around green space and how that affects humans, human health, um, either in an urban environment or in general, and how many trips do we take for outdoor recreation and how does that impact our physical and mental health. So hopefully there'll be a report coming out in the next couple of years about that. And I look forward to studying that. So thank you for that question. There's definitely a lot to learn in that field. Yeah, thanks Roman. Um, Next question. So Bill Sheeman had asked, um, how do you model the boundary between metro areas and non-metro areas? Um, and 
<clears throat> we so mainly we do that by population centers bill. We, we basically you know have uh, for each county the proportion of the population that's in the metro area or not in the metro area. So we keep track of that um, and try to do our best of that. There's actually more work we can we can do on that uh, to try to, to try to do a better job of that in terms of visitation and trips. <clears throat> uh, and you know as we move forward doing additional surveys, we'll try to do a better job on that as well. Um, but we do you know using data from the Census Bureau, uh, and that's the key data we use to try to determine metro area versus non-metro area. Um, how does this compare to other states? That's from Sarah. Actually, um, there are some studies emerging. Uh, actually, Tim might want to talk about that because he has the ORSA data by state. Yeah, I was just pulling that up. Um, the uh, In terms of, uh, I'm looking at the BEA report on this. We didn't do other states using our methods. So uh, uh, to the extent that our methods are comparable to what the BEA did, uh, in terms of total value of uh, uh, outdoor recreation uh, in, ter in terms of total dollars uh, for gross state product, Ohio ranks about ninth in the country, uh, but Ohio has a fairly large economy relative to some other states. Uh, in terms of percentage of uh, gross state product, uh, Ohio ranks about 43rd, uh, so it is uh, fairly small. That's not too surprising that it would have a small uh, relative contribution because um, Ohio just doesn't have those natural attractors in terms of of geography for outdoor recreation. Uh, we don't have mountains. We don't have uh, a marine coastline. Uh, the uh, Lake Erie is probably the biggest natural amenity that, that Ohio has uh, as an attractor, and I'm not sure it has the best reputation outside of Ohio in terms of, of recreation, so it's probably not attracting a lot of people there for expenditures. Uh, so uh, not too surprising, but it's low as a percentage uh, relative to the nation. Uh, uh, well, it's other states, but um, in terms of total value, it's, uh, it's a fairly large number. Great, thanks, Tim. Um, from, from Sarah, a question about whether the pattern of values would sort of continue if we increase public natural lands by 20%. Um, probably so. Uh, so the, what we found in here is that there is a really intense use on state park lands less intense use on other types of lands. So increasing, um, yeah, it's an interesting question, you know, increasing other types of lands besides state parks. Um, you know, my guess is, is the reason why state, many people go to state parks is because they're state parks and they have a lot of development features with them. They have parking 